Hey, so hopefully you all can hear me. Um, it's been a crazy week. Okay, I'll try to. Um, <laughs> hey, so it's good to see everyone. It's been a crazy week. Uh, there's a lot going on, uh, but I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me to give this Bergman Forum. Um, what I'm going to be presenting today uh, is uh, this, well, kind of like a fraction of a series of essays that I've been working on for a little while now called The Ghosts of Instagram. And each one has a slightly different subtitle and um, focuses on a little bit of a different subject matter. But broadly speaking, they're all kind of focused on this um, relationship between photography, social media, information technology, more broadly speaking, um, and like the future, right, and where we're heading. Um, so thank you. Uh, so to, I'm going to be a little scripted today because I haven't had quite had the time to memorize everything I want to talk about. Um, but I'll say, through these essays, I've been seeking to understand the state of contemporary photography, particularly in relation to the emergence of what the writer, theorist, transgender icon Mackenzie Wark has deemed the vectorial economy. So that's a lot of what I'll be talking about today. Um, other more familiar names have been given to that thing. Sometimes neoliberalism is associated with it. I'll be using that word quite a bit. You might also hear words like late capitalism or even post-capitalism. But I really think that Mackenzie Wark's phrase, vectorialism, makes the most sense for reasons that I'm going to go into a little bit later. But I'm going to start by introducing myself to you the way I would introduce myself online. Um, there, I'm more of an artifact than a person, a piece of a whole, this sort of schizophrenic collage of signifiers, titles, accolades, inside jokes, memes, things like that. Um, Kelsey underscore Susanna uh, is an Instagram user. She slash they has published 548 posts, boasts a nearly balanced ratio of 1687 followers to 1877 following, which I know is not that impressive, but I think it is. She slash they are an artist, uh, trans with an asterisk, very important photographer slash writer, visiting assistant professor at arts underscore at underscore Alfred, managing editor of at photo captionist. She slash they received an MFA from Image Text Ithaca in 2020, which has recently transferred from Ithaca College to Cornell. Um, and so now her slash their Instagram bio dubiously implies her having an Ivy League degree. <laughs> Thanks. I thought that was funny. Um, her slash there post, uh, posts uh, appear infrequently these days. Uh, you might get one post a month if you're lucky. They often feature slideshows that contain no less than one pretty picture, one selfie, um, a collection of random happenings that have occurred since my last post, um, and usually one circulating meme that I'm always very proud to curate. Um, if you're inclined to trust the posts, she's living her best life. Um, celebrating little, little victories and looking really hot while she's doing it. Um, now, I'm not really breaking any new ground here when I say um, this, but I think it's really important to acknowledge the fraught relationship that exists between truth um, and the images we curate for ourselves online, um, the images we curate through social media and also through more traditional forms of media. Um, this is all to say that these images, the ones that you encounter when scrolling through my Instagram, are not always honest, and they're not always complete. Um, in many ways, if you only know me through Instagram, I'm hopefully exactly what I want you to think I am. Thanks. I love the laughter. I'm so happy. <laughs> now, I'm pointing out the obvious. Um, because the obvious has a lot to teach us about detangling photography from capitalism, which is the main subject of the conversation that I want to get into today. Um, it also has a lot to teach us about the prototypical relationship between photography and the emergent economies of our time. Um, the question of photography and truth goes back nearly all the way to its inception. Um, as with this self-portrait, of one of my favorite artists, Hippolyte Bayard. Um, this is a self-portrait of him as a drowned man, which was taken in 1840, just one year after the public invention of the first commercially viable photographic processes. For those who don't know, Bayard was one of many, including Henry Fox Talbot and Louis Daguerre, um, who nearly simultaneously invented photography. Um, first, you know, they all independently developed commercially viable processes, all which required different chemical outputs, different technologies. Um, and if you're familiar with history, you know, this all happened uh, 
like several like a like a, over a decade after Nice Foray Niepce's um, original invention of photography in 1826, um, which was not yet a commercially viable pro, pro, uh, practice. Um, so Bayard was one of three very famous people who invented photography, right? All separate, all independent, lay all on their own. Um, Bayard took the back seat to Louis Duguerre, um, whose daguerreotype set the standard for photography throughout the French Empire and the Francophile world. Um, so the daguerreotype sort of took off while Baird's standard of photography was sort of a little bit lost to history, right? Um, which is something he was always a little ticked off about, right? So he produces this image um, as an act of what I would say like theatrical audacity, a way of sort of protesting the fact that he had been left out of this photographic historical canon in favor of somebody like Louis Daguerre. Um, I love this picture so much. Sorry, I have like hair in my mouth. Um, I love this, this photo so much because this photo has a lot to teach us about the idea of photography and truth. Just one year after the invention of a commercially viable photographic practice, um, Hippolyte Baird is sort of left out of the conversation. He's a little frustrated about it. And he makes this image, this image of himself as a drowned man. And if you take a look at the image, you can see some things he did to, in order to emphasize the illusion, right? You can see his face is dyed a little dark and his hands are also dyed dark, um, which are apparently symptomatic of what you might find somebody who's experienced asphyxiation. So he's making himself look like he's drowned. And on the back of this photograph, there's the caption that reads, self-portrait of a drowned man, 1840. Um, so for Bayard, photography and truth was not something to be connected. Um, even just one year after the invention of photography, people had this association with the idea that photographs told the truth. And Bayard, as this sort of uh, marginal figure in history, is one of the first people to point out that you can fake a photograph, that you can make things look real with the use of the camera. Um, I think it's a really skillful and significant manipulation. When I look at this photograph, what I'm delighted by is the presence of the postmodern um, born therein at the same time as moderni modernity's estranged twin. Here, the postmodern impulse haunts photography and promises something delightfully dishonest. Um, other gestures have been made to complicate the relationship between truth and photography throughout its history. As with this image, this is taken from a series of images of the Cottingley fairies um, of the early 20th century. Here, Elsie Wright and her sister Frances Griffiths staged encounters with fairies, which were just small cardboard cutouts they had produced um, that caused a stir when they hit the media because they were taken by a lot of people as proof of the existence of fairies. At just the age of 16 and seven, which I think is just one of the coolest parts of the story, these sisters were able to cleverly manipulate expecta the expectations of their audience to provide the world with what the world considered to be proof for a very short period of time. Um, that photographs could be made to lie and often were made to lie was something that a lot of people already knew. It wasn't like huge groundbreaking news even at that time. But many people in the public and in the media did believe these photographs when they saw them. So there's a way in which, regardless of our skepticism for images, the picture can still hold us captive. So unable to rid ourselves of the talismanic authority of, of the image, photographs then and now continue to bite us with this presumed sense of honesty, right? Um, when interviewed several decades later, the sisters admitted to their hoax, but maintained the existence of those fairies as a reality. They may not have photographed the fairies, but they were able to capture their spirit, they would say, um, ex except here in this photograph, which is the last of five images in the series, um, which Francis, the younger sister, swore was the only real photo of fairies they had actually taken. I personally think it's a lot more fun to believe her, to believe that the other four are fake, but this one is definitely, these are real fairies. Now, I just want to quickly remind you, I'm talking a lot about photography, but I think that the implications that this conversation has um, really extends far out beyond photography into image culture and media more broadly. Um, there are lessons that we can take uh, from, from photography, right? Take, for example, deep fake technology. 
Um, we can also think of AI generated images. We might also think of propagandistic news cycles and a host of other contemporary technologies. And we can say, and we can see that something very strange continues to haunt the image despite our collective skepticism of images, right? Um, here I find myself dwelling upon WJT Mitchell's assertion um, that though the image is not an agent, images aren't people by any reasonable metric, it's difficult for us to approach the image with reason. Um, in his book, What Do Pictures Want? Mitchell argues that it may be better um, for us to address images as the talismanic items our instincts want them to be. To entertain the idea that though images are not alive, our minds may be incapable of truly accepting, deeply accepting that fact. In lieu of a collective skepticism around the image, Mitchell suggests that it might be more interesting to analyze images as if they really had desires, as if they really want things, to ask ourselves, what do pictures want? As a way, not of understanding images, but as a way of understanding desire more broadly. And I'll just read this quote. In short, we are stuck with our magical pre-modern attitudes towards objects, especially pictures, and our task is not to overcome these attitudes, but to understand them and to work through their symptomology. Um, I think much of his argument can be grafted uh, from the question of agency and the image to the question of truth, right? Um, we know that pictures lie, and yet we so often fall for them. Uh, maybe it's better or just easier to accept that and figure out for ourselves what that means. I should digress though, because this isn't really an essay about photography and truth, which is territory that has been explored. Um, it's really an essay about photography and capitalism. The relationship between the camera, capitalism, and most importantly for me here, post-capitalist futures. Um, my argument around here stands to demonstrate an underlying current within the discourse around photography. Here, I am seeking to imagine the photograph as a vector, um, as a pathway for the transmission of information, whether or not that information is truthful. Um, much had been made about the unique relationship uh, between photography and the rise of modern capitalist imperial states. This is a great book, See Capitalism in the Camera. Um, but those narratives sometimes collapse the complexity of these questions, operating under the assumption that photography is one, overwhelmingly a capitalist technology, and that two, capitalism itself is easy to place and easy to understand. I will say to this book's credit that it's actually a really robust analysis of the relationship between photography and capitalism, or I should say capitalism and the camera because it also talks on cinema a little bit. Um, so I'm not blasting this book, check it out, it's very good. Um, what I want to argue, however, is that photography is no longer necessarily a capitalist technology, that its transformation into something different um, does not necessarily mean that it's something better. But, and that's what I want to take a look at. So in her book, Capital is Dead, Is This Something Worse? Mackenzie Wark, who I mentioned a little while ago, um, asks us to engage in a thought experiment. She asks us to assume that capitalism has been usurped by a new economy. What does that economy look like? Uh, what does it do to people? And might it be worse than capitalism in some ways? Um, I, for one, find myself really compelled by her argument. And I would definitely recommend reading this book if you ever have a chance. Um, it holds that our economy can no longer be referred to as a capitalist system because capitalists no longer dominate the system. In lieu of Marx's means of production, she is suggesting the means of distribution as the new center of power. Um, in this economic model, it's not those who own the factories uh, that own the world, but those who own the roads, and by extension, those who own various vectors of information and material distribution. Uh, she might specifically look at Amazon as a good example, the most powerful, you know, richest company in the world, right? Um, it has this incredibly complex network of shipping, and it uses these incredibly complex algorithms to plan resource distribution as if it was a command economy. Um, but we might also consider the stock market as an example of a vectorial, vectorial system, social media companies as a vectorial system, copyright laws as an artifact of vectorialism, and also companies like uh, cultural conglomerates like Disney. Um, all of those systems control the flow of materials or the flow of intellectual property, these flow of information, right? And they, in many ways, have replaced factory owners um, as the main power player within this economy, which to Mackenzie Wark is big enough of a difference to 
define it as an entirely separate and new economy. Even photography itself, the image as vector for information, uh, might be said to operate within this framework. Um, if this is true of photography, then we might begin to understand the medium within both an historical and contemporary context. If photography is truly a neoliberal or vectorial form, what does that mean for photographers and how might we escape the inertia of its accelerating rush toward a world of pure and inhumane competition? Um, some versions of this argument have already been attempted, such as this book by George Kohlberg, which was written in 2021 or published in 2021, uh, titled Photography's Neoliberal Realism and published by Mac. Um, unfortunately, this book really fails um, to truly contend with the implications of its titles, preferring instead to dwell upon a, a shallow and what I feel like is a sort of self-flagellating uh, case against photography in a way that really can be said to operate on neo neoliberal logic in and of itself. She never, uh, he, George Kohlberg, uh, never once contends with surveillance technologies, um, doesn't consider the effects of austerity upon photography and art more broadly. Um, he's claiming to make this argument, to trace this argument about the inherent neoliberalism of the field, but it's kind of an uninteresting argument that rests upon the inaccurate reading of Mark Fisher's capitalist realism, and that hinges upon the criticism of artists who were most relevant in the 1990s. Um, this is all to say that I think that Kohlberg's base observation is correct, but that he fails to grapple with the premise of his own argument, um, at, you know, so much so that he almost reinforces the neoliberal logic of photographs in making his argument. Um, I think that in doing that, he really collapses the possibility that photography could ever be anything but neoliberal. Um, that is the question that I really want to contend with in these essays. That's what I've sort of been working towards. Can photography be anything but capitalist, neoliberal, vectorial in nature? Is it possible that it is already beyond capitalism? And if so, how can we as photographers or artists situate ourselves to rail against these new conditions? Which brings me to part one. <laughs> Boom and bust, a recent history of photo books, of the photo book. Um, so if anyone here is a fan of photography, you probably know that for the last 10 to 12 years, the photo book has been the real center of power for photography. Um, I've been involved in the photo book industry in my, myself and in, in some very, um, in ways that I'm very proud and ways that I would say are very, um, very cool, if I do say so myself. Uh, <laughs> this is one book that I worked on. Um, this is Joanne Walters' Wood River Blue Pool, which is one of the coolest examples of text and image relationships. It was published by ITI Press before um, I ended up joining the program. Um, it's a beautiful book of photographs. It contains an excellent essay by Laura Wexler that actually basically operates, I would say, argues with Joanne's photographs in a way that's really meaningful, really contending with the racial politics of her photographs. Um, and then there's also this additional text, this book that sits on top of the other book, which is a beautiful short story about the space that Joanne Walters was photographing in. I think this is a good example of the kind of book uh, that we've seen in the last 10 years, photo books that really push the medium forward, that really change what it means to look at photographs and to engage um, with, with photographs. So there's a lot of power and potential in photo book publishing. I think it's possible to trace the course of this photo book boom over the lifetime of Aperture's Foundation, Aperture Foundation's The Photo Book Review, which published roughly two issues a year over the course of around a decade. Um, I've had the unique pleasure of working on two of these issues, um, one on image and text relationships, and most proudly, the 20th issue, this one here, which is also the final issue of The Photo Book Review. Personally, I think it's no coincidence that Aperture decided to shutter the publication when it did. Um, it is now incorporated into the flagship publication, Aperture Magazine, um, as a short column in each issue rather than as an independent piece of publishing in and of itself. Um, in 2021, when we finished this issue, it was clear that the market for photo books was rapidly receding, a trend that was accelerated by supply chain crisis, uh, by the supply chain crisis for paper, market oversaturation, and the dead zone that the early years of, co of the COVID-19 pandemic left in the portfolios of many photographers. Um, PBR had, for around a decade, situated Aperture, one of the largest and most influential photo book publishers, at the head of the market for photo book publishing. Through PBR, Aperture operated as the barometer of good tastes in photo book publishing, simultaneously defending its market position while really legitimately championing the form. Um, but I asked the question, why did the photo book review happen when it did? 
this is a graph that we had in the last issue of the photo book review that is sort of <laughs> dubious. Um, it's sort of marking um, the number of new photo book publishers that opened each year between 1999 and 2021 with a total of 485. Um, in the editor's note of this issue, uh, the French photography historian and curator Clement Chereau tried to argue that the photo book phenomenon is more than just a fad. Um, his argument is one that I really agree with. Um, printed matter is important, libraries are powerful, photographs do way better on the page than they do on the wall, and there's really no better way of distributing high fidelity reproductions of photographs to a lot of people than between the covers of a book. Um, at the same time, I can't help but to feel some healthy skepticism about the photo book market. Um, sometimes it starts to feel like we're all just sort of astroturfing this market um, that once didn't really exist, at least not in the capacity that it does today. Um, so why did that market come into maturity when it did? And what does it mean that a once fertile field of possibility uh, has collapsed into a tame market that it is today? Um, so then I take a look at this infographic here. Um, if we look closely, we'll see that the precipitous boom uh, in photo book publishing might roughly correspond with the year 2010. That's when you can see, you know, 33 publishers. And then in 2011, you have 36 publishers opening their doors. Um, so you have this boom in the number of people getting into photo book publishing. Consider the market in 2010, and we can start to imagine a narrative. Um, it's possible on one hand that everyone just suddenly became interested in photo books um, and photo book publishing. Um, but might there be material reasons for this specific uptick? Now I'm speculating here, and at the risk of speculating, I'll say, to me, this model maps the very real effects of the 2008 financial crash and the subsequent catastrophe of real estate accessibility, which we're still living through today, especially in major cities. Following the bursting of the housing bubble in 2008, rent prices in major cities began to preclude the cultivation of a healthy gallery, private gallery ecosystem. In short, galleries began to close down, crowded out as they were by the advanced stages of gentrification, which they had helped lay the groundwork for. And in the absence of, this, of these galleries, as these small spaces started to close down, we have to ask what alternatives existed for photography. And that, to me, is where photo book publishing comes into play. In many ways, the trajectory around this photo book boom follows the, traje the trajectory of Instagram itself, while also operating as its hauntological alternative. As the platform gained notoriety, there's no doubt that free advertising via Instagram helped to contribute to the, to the success of many small and mid-sized publishers at a time when few other avenues for following photo books existed. For years, Instagram was incentivized to fuel this market, if only because that market, like Aperture's photo book review, allowed Instagram to position itself as a chief tastemaker for photography more broadly. It was a marketing tool. We market their books. They come to Instagram looking for books that we're marketing. Um, as I'll later argue, this pact is now over between Instagram and the photography world. Um, and that leaves us, that ending of this pact leaves us with some very real questions about how to move forward. Now, there's nothing wrong with the existence of a fun uh, alternative market, especially as an alternative to niche, uh, to like an, as an alternative niche to other less accessible forms of artistic dis distribution. Not everyone lives in a major city and has access to a robust gallery ecosystem. Um, not everyone can afford to purchase very big and very expensive prints and put on their walls. Um, so I'm not bashing photo book publishing, broadly speaking. I'm just trying to analyze it and understand it. If there is something wrong, it is that the misrepresentation, it is that there is a gross misrepresentation of the market's success and stability. I say this as somebody who's found myself at every angle in the photo book market. I'm a consumer, I buy books all the time. I'm a producer, I make my own books. Um, I'm a writer, I write for other people's books. I'm an editor, I've worked for Aperture and small publishers on photo books. Um, I'm also a critic, I write a lot about books that I like and books that I don't like. Um, I'm a real champion for photo books. I like photo books a lot. Um, I can say, you know, working from big publishers like Aperture all the way down to little publishers that are just run out of like my friend's living room, one truth remains at every scale. Um, it's a truth that only one of my favorite photo book publishers, the Deadbeat Club, readily admits to. On their website, you can buy this gorgeous tote um, that says there's no money in books. Um, I appreciate the frankness of the Deadbeat Club's declaration there. Um, 
across the board, you know, artists and publishers are from Aperture and everywhere else are lucky if they break even on their projects. This condition is obviously not unique to photography. I'm sure that most of the artists who are sitting in this room know that there is no money in books, um, but that there's also not a lot of money in art more broadly speaking. So when I talk about the neoliberalism of the market, this is what I'm getting at. Um, I think that an analysis of photo book publishing trends over the last 10 years is actually a great way to understand what Wark is talking about when she talks about vectorialism. Here, competition for profit is superseded by competition for recognition and control of the means of information distribution through these various publishers. From Instagram to Aperture, it is less important to make money than it is to ensure that your voice uh, dominates the discourse. The position of publishers like Aperture and artists who are engaging in those sorts of publishing practices, just as a quick aside, is something that Mackenzie Wark would refer to as a, a, a hacker's identity. You know, the hacker class is something she writes a lot about. If you want to know more about it, you can read her book, The Hacker Manifesto. And it's a really great way of understanding our class positions as artists and intellectuals within this economy. But I have to digress for the sake of time. Now, when I've named the first of these essays, the subtitle on photography at the end of the world held two meanings for me. The first uh, is probably the most common idea of thinking about the end of the world, and that's as a temporal phenomenon. We can think of the apocalypse, Armageddon, obliteration, maybe revolution, if we're feeling optimistic. Uh, but I also think of the phrase as being spatial in nature. Here we might think of, uh, of the end of the world as its periphery, um, as the fugitive state, the frontier, the wilderness, the subaltern, things that exist at the margins of the world. Um, with that in mind, I think it's really important to discuss the end of the world robustly in this moment for reasons that are honestly grim and optimistic. So I feel like we live in a state of perpetual crisis, and I'm probably not the only one to make that observation. There are lots of reasons why people feel like the world is ending. We have these record-breaking weather events, which are known broadly and almost ironically at this point to us as the general effects of climate change. We have this growing crescendo of calls for war on a global scale. As a trans person, the torrent of news I read every day about anti-trans legislative efforts terrifies me and makes me terrified for my future. Artists are also susceptible to entertaining the possibility of our own private apocalypses, as AI art, NFTs, and other technologies have left many feeling panicked about the state of art moving forward. At the same time, I'm also pretty skeptical of this recent profusion of apocalyptic narratives, in part because they strike me as being too easy and too convenient. I don't think that the world is ending. In fact, I think it might be all the more terrifying for us to consider the possibility that we're going to have to live with the consequences of what's happening right now for the rest of our lives. What if we reject the notion that the world is, that the world is ending and instead consider the possibility that it may only be a world that is ending? Mark Fisher's essay on capitalist realism famously begins with this quote by Slakov Zizek, which I think might be like, paraphrased. I don't know that it's quoted word for word. The quote is, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And if you've been on Twitter in the last 10 years, you've almost definitely read this, um, this quote, at least. Um, personally, I think there's a framework for understanding the rolling crises of our time as, a, as the product of a quiet revolution, one that has seen the, the capitalist world succeeded by that victorialist world that we were talking about before. Mark Fisher's later work begins to explore that possibility. His lectures on post-capitalist desire seem to recognize that, good or bad, capitalism's alternative may have already arrived. Because it's so hard for us to imagine alternatives to capitalism, we may perceive its waning influence in apocalyptic terms. These are the death throes of capitalism. It's terrifying, it's dangerous, it's indeterminate. Um, but capitalism is mortal, which is maybe good news. Um, we look at these symptoms and see a world that's crumbling, falling apart. We oftentimes fail to recognize what is taking root underneath all of that. Um, this is honestly a grand line of inquiry, and it's not something I have the bandwidth or perspective to really investigate or analyze, except through the lens of photography and art. Um, but when I'm really paying attention to the world around me and looking at things closely, uh, I start to see this everywhere, not just in the arts. In the United States, it's really easy to track the history of photography along the contours of the history of capitalism and industrialization um, and also imperial expansion. 
Uh, this is part of the reason why it's so hard to imagine a post-capitalist photography. Um, ooh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Photography was a necessary tool for imperialist expansionary projects. Throughout its earliest years, photography was a chief tool for white surveyors taking stock of stolen lands. Cameras sold the West to white colonizers. Cameras contributed to warfare, surveillance, and the reification of the police state. Cameras helped to turn us into consumers of fashion, of products, of body standards, of pharmaceuticals, and even of politicians. Here, I might start to think of Guy, Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle. I might also think about hyper-reality, uh, a la Jean Baudrillard. Um, and I also start to think of Deleuze's societies of control. But um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep moving. Now, all of these arguments apply just as well, for the most part, um, to moving images as to photography. Uh, but I think there's something really on the nose about the quality of still images and the history of still photography that makes them great tools for considering the relationship between capitalism and image culture. One really important Part of the equation for me is, excuse me, the growing obsolescence of the still image. As you know, increasingly we're consuming moving images on our phones, on television, in the cinema. The still image is sort of falling into the background as being less important, less significant. And it's almost that obsolescence that I'm starting to be more interested in these days. So, you know, I think that might be one reason why Walter Benjamin and Susan Sontag and other cultural theorists have really focused on photography more so than on cinema. Um, both of them certainly looked at cinema, spent a lot of time writing and thinking about cinema, but it was really photography that they were more interested in because of its particular set of contradictions. Um, Benjamin is probably best known for this essay, um, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, um, which is one that I literally talk about all the time and that I'm going to make my students read. Watch out, Liz. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you're all probably somewhat familiar with Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. He's making a really broad argument about fascism and all of these other things, but he talks quite a bit about photography as a mechanically reproduced technology and the way in which photography has contributed to the erosion of what he calls the aura of art. Um, before he wrote Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, though, he did write A History of Photography, which is another great essay, which I have made my students read. Um, in my opinion, it's one of the best summations of the early years of photography. Um, he says a lot in that essay, but I especially enjoy the way he frames the history of photography as first, like in the first decade or so, a history of craftspeople figuring out how to make photographs work, and then following the mass production of cameras and the wide distribution of photographic chemistry, a history of hacks um, as the medium began to become overcrowded, in his opinion, with people who might have years earlier just kind of been shitty painters. <laughs> I love it. It's got so much sass. It's a good essay. Um, but Benjamin does settle in that essay upon the work of Eugene Ache um, as the first properly modernist photographer. And here, like, I'm not going to do it, but just keep in mind modern and modernism and modernist can all sort of have related definitions, but all very different definitions, right? So he's calling, he's criticizing modernity in this essay, but he's also like, but Ache is a modernist and he's cool. Um, so Benjamin saw. Ache as an artist, as, as a real artist, in contrast to a host of other photographers that he was seeking to criticize in that essay. I think that Benjamin was attracted uh, to Ache's work because that work purportedly gives us a glimpse into Paris at a moment of inflection as modernity, another one of those words, was taking hold of the city through electrification and through industrial development. I remember being taught about Ache. Um, by a professor many years ago, and having his work framed as representing the moment before consumer capitalism fully took hold in Paris and maybe Europe more broadly. But I really disagree with that assessment, if only because within Aceh's work, we can see allusions to that form of capitalism, even if it's only in a larval state, as we can see with this image here. Um, I think it's useful here to pause and to take a closer look at Aceh's life and finance. Ache was closely connected to the city's artistic community. Um, he often sold his photographs as reference in surrealist paintings, and many of the surrealists knew him very well for that reason. Yet Ache never made very much money in his life. He died in relative obscurity before his photographs were resurrected years later by curators and artists like Bernice Abbott. Um, if Ache's life can be said to operate in opposition to capitalism and to modernity in the way that I think Benjamin is trying to do, um, or at least at its margin, if not in opposition. Um, it does so because Ache's mission, his obsession, was in capturing views of old Paris. 
that obsession transcended for him the market imperative of making tourist photographs, of making portraits of people who are passing through, which would have made him a lot more money. Um, it's just funny to me to think of Ache as this champion of modernism uh, in art, somewhat forgotten at the time of his death, only to be exhumed for the art market's reverie. Um, it's even funnier to me that Benamine writes on Ache without really contending with that side of the story in the essay. Um, it's honestly a, a story that, as artists, we're all probably familiar with. We can think of many artists whose work only took off in death. Um, I think of Ache as somebody who operated both at the temporal end of the world, you know, the end of old Paris as it was beginning to industrialize and electrify. Um, but I also think of Ache as somebody who was operating at the spatial end of the world. At the margins of an art market, he would inspire only in death. I think of Ache and his work in terms of hauntology. That is, Ache shows us a world that did exist, that could have continued to exist, but that most definitely no longer exists. Here, his images operate as specters. They haunt us, they remind us of alternative futures. Part three, ghost towns, Instagram algorithms and the vector. Um, much has changed about the economy around photography since Benamine wrote, um, but I think it's hard to underestimate, and I'm zooming forward a lot here, I'm sorry, uh, to underestimate the impact of Instagram <laughs> in particular and the impact it's had on photography since its advent in 2010. I often quip that it might be possible for somebody, not me, uh, <laughs> to track decisions that were made in the boards of social media companies um, to the walls of the Whitney Biennial. Um, if anyone felt inclined, but that's not necessarily a research project I want to get into. Um, and yet in these last few years, Instagram's waning influence and its brief decoupling with photography, its algorithmic insistence upon video as it was trying to outcompete TikTok, um, have left photographers in the dust. Though the company has taken steps to re-engage photographers, I think it's hard to underestimate the impact that that moment when they when they de-centered photography and algorithmically supported videos over photographs. I think it's hard to underestimate the impact that that exact moment had on photography. Um, I personally feel that it's directly contributed to the waning influence of photo book publishing, which is sort of bringing it back to a topic I was talking about before. When I began writing these essays, I was intent to analyze a ver one very specific phenomenon in photo book publishing, um, which I saw as a direct product of Instagram's influence. Um, the emergence, the emergent form of what I called the small run open call based group publication. And I know that's a lot of words for something consistent. These publications seem to have come to a crescendo in and around 2020. They represent an alternative to the gallery group show and often boast a wide assortment of artists responding to a specific prompt, maybe something like thematic like queerness or nature or some other somewhat niche but also very widely shared concept. I don't actually think it's worth criticizing these publications on their face, but naming the trend feels important to me. Um, it felt like one very obvious way to point out the influence Instagram had on photography as a whole. I say that because the main conceit of these publications is that in principle, they're really easy to sell. Um, you know, start an open call, you include 50 photographers in that open call, you print 100 copies, and then you ask all of those photographers to go about on their networks advertising this publication. You're activating social media's algorithms in such a way that makes these things really easy to move. Um, your publication sells out with no problem. Um, it's not really so much a cynical approach to art book production as it is a really clever manipulation of Instagram's network for the purpose of getting work out there. Um, I attributed the rise of popularity in these publications to a growing need within the photo community more broadly, the need we feel for recognition, for community, and for placement within a discursive canon. And when I say discursive canon, I am again thinking about that vector of information we were talking about before. Um, I have contributed to so many of these publications, so I am just as guilty. Um, I have cu curated them. Uh, my name is on this list. Uh, here, this is a great one. You should definitely pick it up. Um, I've advertised it on my Instagram. Um, I've written for these, um, and I really like them. But at the end of the day, I don't think that they're very good uh, vehicles for photographs. They don't really transmit very, photographs very well. They're often a little awkward. They're very clunky. They can be very poorly printed by necessity. Um, usually, they're printed on demand by a service like Blurb. Um, and they often read as little more than like an Instagram feed made physical. 
as just a list of name, photograph, name, photograph. Um, at their worst, these publications always felt to me to be aggressively atomizing, fragmentary, and disjointed. At their best, they could sometimes be really fun, they could be really freeing, and they also look really great on someone's CV. Now, in many ways, Instagram operates as a perfect case study for the late ascendancy of neoliberalism or vectorialism and its domination over photography. Suffering through decades of austerity in the arts, the 2008 financial crash, and the closing of institutions like galleries, Instagram swept in as photography's savior. Neoliberal economies are vacuous and hard to pin down in the same way that words like socialism sometimes appear empty. As a stand-in word, neoliberal sometimes feels like it could really mean whatever people want it to mean. Allow me to project my own perspective for a minute in saying that neoliberalism is largely defined primarily by an attack on the state-run regulatory apparatus, social safety nets, and as an artist, I say that, and I include public grants um, in rhetorical service of the synthesis between classical liberalism and conservative economics. Neoliberalism is what emerges when the alternatives fade away. It works by transforming the social economy into an atomized economy, offloading the cost of everything from healthcare, housing, art production, and advertising onto the consumers. In transforming the social economy of photography, neoliberalism sells us on an empty collectivism. It says that with tools like Instagram, we can break through, build our networks, and transform the world for the better. This, of course, conceals the underlying superstructure of the economy upon which it is built. Instagram needs to make money. And again, you know, we as consumers are also its main raw material, its coal mine. What is left in all of this is a bastardized social economy, one that continues to offload the cost of making work onto the artists who make it, generating tremendous amounts of debt to keep afloat an infrastructure we've yielded fully to capital, all while laundering that same capital's reputation. What I find really insidious about it is that it's also done so by offloading the cost of social progress onto us, the artists as well. Instead of redistributing, instead of redistributing resources, we've accepted our, our draft as foot soldiers in this war that I don't think can be won through these means. Now, I don't know about you, but Instagram has been really boring lately. <laughs> I get a lot of advertisements. I just figured out the other day that I, I'll buy a perfume if it looks really nice. Uh, and now all I have are perfume advertisements. And I'm like, well, I bought my perfume. Why would I need more? Um, every time I log in, I can't help but to feel like I'm really wandering through this long since abandoned ghost town. A lot of people are off of Instagram, not interested in it, broadly speaking. Um, I, rarely leave, I rarely leave the platform feeling anything but bored, angry, jealous, or hungry for the engagement that used to sustain me. I can't help but to feel that the party is over and that there's nowhere to go but down from here. In a way, I think it's a bit silly for me to advance this criticism now, um, but I also think it's pertinent. For the sake of time, I'm going to flip through a little quickly. Um, so this essay does get kind of depressing. Um, still, I think it's really important to consider these failings at a moment of inflection like the one that we're in. Recognizing that Instagram is no longer our home so much it is, as it is maybe at the very least like a convenient Rolodex um, is important in charting our course forward. Recognizing the destabilization of the photo book market, especially in the wake of the pandemic, allows us to consider that market more skeptically. The photo book emerged as photography's dominant mode in part out of crisis. As publishing had become more important within photography and as, these crisis, uh, and as the crisis of production and distribution deepen, we can see similar dynamics unfolding here and now. Um, I'm skipping forward ahead because I don't wanna go too far over our time. Um, you know, and then, so I've been thinking a lot about small book publishers who I really love. And I actually think that small book publishing is a really important part of any healthy art ecosystem. I don't think it's possible to make books that are very interesting unless you have small publishers that are interested in making small books and taking risks and putting those out there and watching them fail or succeed sometimes. Um, at the same time, I see that these market forces are very damaging to people. Um, everyone who runs a small press that I know is exhausted and stressed. They're barely, you know, making, you know, they're barely breaking even, oftentimes not even breaking even. Um, which is all to say that I think the very material conditions that we're living through right now, the things that we're dealing with, are just not conducive to the production of these kinds of projects anymore. Um, now, I also want to think about alternatives because this essay 
is ultimately about alternatives, what exists on the other side of this. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of working on this book, uh, what they saw, historical photo books by women. Um, in this book, uh, I was given a section to research from the 1970s through to the mid 1980s, um, which I think is kind of interesting because that follows the early rise of neoliberalism, mainly through Thatcher and Reagan in the United States and in the UK. Um, and in this investigation, I found this book, uh, Putting Myself in the Picture by Joe Spence. And Joe Spence is my alternative for all of you today. She is my optimism through all of this. In this book, and it's like one of the most generous books that I've ever read, it's absolutely gorgeous. And as an artist, I think everyone here should read it. Um, she talks in depth about her life um, as she's exploring all of these different photographic styles and photographic processes. There is a copy in Shoals you should check out. Um, it's very hard to get your hands on otherwise. So Spence was an artist, an activist, a socialist, a feminist, and a self-described educational photographer. She was born into a working class family in London in 1934. Um, Spence was drawn to art photography in the 1970s at a time of heightened political conflict in the city. Throughout her career, she focused on the medium's influence on the construction of age, gender, sexuality, familial, and class identities. She defined herself through a radical ethos of self-empowerment and humanism, variously taking to cameras to document her own experiences or to teach others how to utilize photography as an expression of their own visual autonomy. Putting myself in the pictures is an insanely generous text, breaking down her career in uh, breaking down her career in each of its major phases based on different chapters, um, from her experiences as a secretary working in a photography studio to her late life work, uh, wherein she was contending with the effects of breast cancer upon her body. This book serves as a rare glimpse into the most radically honest telling of an artist's life, full as it was with conflict, doubt, and failed experimentation. We get to see her situate herself as a worker during her days on the high street, running her own photo gallery. We get to see her experiment with social documentary photography and documenting London's Romani community, wrestling with and eventually succumbing to criticisms of the problematic ethics of social documentary practices. We get to see her experiment with the camera in the creation of more conceptual works of art, experimenting with gender and performances in ways that continue to feel so relevant today. We get to see her settle on the feeling that photographs uh, themselves were never the thing that would allow her to affect political change, but that photography as a practice of placing ourselves within that flow of information might. Um, she had worked hard to educate other workers, and this is sort of like where her career took off. She started running these public workshops, and during these public workshops, she would invite workers, especially women and people from other marginalized communities, to seize control of our own narratives. If I seem pessimistic before, then I promise I'm not. To be honest, I'll probably keep contributing to those publications. I'll keep posting on social media. Um, you know, uh, I want to keep my practice open. I want to continue teaching other people how to make photographs. I think it's really important for us in this moment to let go of some specific and very toxic ideas in art and photography more broadly. Namely, the idea that these things are things that need to inherently be taken very seriously. I know it's hard to let go of the idea that art should be taken seriously when it's the thing that you've dedicated your life to. Maybe I think we'd be better off just taking life less seriously in general. What I do know is that seriousness obscures contradiction and undermines potential. Just as the modern photo book uh, industry emerged from the gallery real estate crisis, so too might something else emerge from the crisis we are in now regarding social media and publishing. Just as book-based projects emerged from the playful enthusiasm of a dying market, so too might the next best thing. The truth is that photography has never been a very good place to affect change in the world. At best, it might be a place to play and to have fun. At its most effective, the proliferation of photographic literacy can benefit the world by helping to fertilize a more open society. I have this dream that in a future, you know, in a utopian future, all we'll have left are artists. What is left for us to do in this moment is to work towards that future. It's a future that might best be served by our general refusal to engage within the types of competition that alienate us from each other and which seek to make photography the exclusive purview of a few specialized, educated, and indebted people. 
We can look to the past for examples, as I do when I'm thinking about Jo Spence and how incredibly generous her practice was. Um, it's also very funny, and I'm always thinking about humor in photography and how her sense of humor and her irreverence reminds me of Hippolyte Baird's photograph from the beginning. Um, so, you know, we can look for examples like Joe Spence, um, but I think maybe it's not always best to borrow our language. Um, instead, I think maybe we should just try to fuck around a little more and find out. Thank you. I swear I timed that at 40 minutes and now I'm way over 40 minutes, so I'm so sorry. I'm gonna definitely be late for my class. I know that some people have to leave. Uh, do you have to leave as well? Um, I have a few minutes. Okay, people who have to leave can leave and people who've got questions. Uh, please ask Kelsey. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. This was really fascinating. I appreciate it. And while I was sitting here, I followed you on Instagram. I uh, uh, I, I found myself uh, pondering something as you, uh, particularly about the rise and fall of photo books and in and, and general, and and related to your very last point about the sort of you know maybe democratizing photography between artists and you know public or whatever. It's interesting to sort of also chart that against the time. Thinking of my own experience, and it would probably sound like an egotistical question, but around that time was also when we all started getting like super sophisticated cameras in our pockets. And I've always enjoyed photo books bought them, given them as gifts. And if I go somewhere, I want a photo book. But I started realizing how accessible and easy it was to make my own photo book and to take my own pictures. And I feel like maybe perhaps um, I, I uh, then end up not, as an unintended consequence, sort of like undervaluing the, the work of artists as I sort of become obsessed with, oh, I can take my own picture and, and do my own thing with it. I'm old enough to remember, and then I'll shut up, uh, being on high school yearbook when pr producing a photo book was enormously yeah. labor and cost intensive. And now I can make one on Shutterfly for like a hundred bucks, yeah. you know? So I think that also comes into play with uh, the whole image of what you're sharing with us today, which was just so interesting. Did it, was this recorded? I want some friends to hear it. Thank you. Uh, I would say, yes, technology obviously has a huge impact on the way. And, and I would say like digital, yes, digital imaging technology has definitely impacted photography in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, uh, uh, but also publishing book, book printing on demand is like a huge new innovation in the last like seven years or eight years that's really contributed to it. So technology is an important part of the equation. The one thing I would say is, um, I was kind of poking back a little bit at Walter Benjamin because I think he rests on this idea that photography is inundated with with charlatans was the word that he used. Um, people who had easy enough access to the technology that they didn't, they didn't really have to think about it. Um, I think I would say to that, that Walter Benjamin is taking art a little too seriously. <laughs> Any other questions? Cool, 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 cool. If anybody else have their hand up, I'm hogging the mic, sorry. Uh, just that I also found myself thinking about the famous uh, images of, of Trump and Obama's uh, uh, inaugurations and Kellyanne's, you know, alternative reality between the two photographs of whether or not yeah. there were actually more people there. And so you, your your notion of, you know, I find fascinating, I want to process it more of like, uh, uh, photography has always kind of been an illusion from the very outset. And what do we make of the truth that pictures do or do not present? And, right. and what does that mean in the present age of questioning reality and questioning truth? So, yeah, I totally agree. I actually think that the Trump presidency is one of these moments when we really started talking about the idea of the relationship between truth and images. You know, I remember fake, you know, fake news and and actually the books that I was including in the presentation when I was talking about post-truth are both like post-Trump books that were an seeking to analyze that phenomenon. So, uh, you know, we're a few years out from that and now I'm thinking about what are the next steps past post-truth. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's thank Kelsey again for a wonderful talk. Thanks. Please, if you have questions, please come to the front and ask him.